let's go back to the beginning. Yep. Tell us about how you first joined the Port Cable Steelworks. What brought you to this place? I always liked science subjects and, and maths. So I swung to metallurgy and applied for a job here. And I got accepted as a metallurgy trainee on the 15th of December 1959. When you applied for the job, you had to write out, of course, your full name, which was George Anthony Edgar. My dad's name was George, so I got brought up as a Tony. So my wife still calls me Tony. All my family does, and a lot of people in Wollongong still refer to me as Tony, and a lot refer to me as George. Well, how it happened was, there were eight trainees started that same day, and the only local one was me, in the test house that is, and Dick was reading out the names. And he got to me and he said, who's George Edgar? I said, well that's me, but I don't get called George, I get called Tony. And he said, son, the bloody bit of paper says your name's George and that's what it is. Everyone else thought it was a huge joke. And everybody called me George and that was stuck. I moved across the flat products and did research, uh, template research, with a fine old gentleman named Dr. Stiebel. And uh, we did shelf life tests on template cans, which was an interesting job. And I got rung up one day by the boss of the flat products area, Cesc Francis, told me to report to the strip at 7.20 on Monday morning. I was going to start working production, so, and that's where it started, all from there, I guess, and uh, what would I have been, maybe 21, 20, 21 at that stage, I think it was probably around about 1969, I got appointed to the monthly staff, and so, you were told, unofficially, that this report was going to happen on this particular day. You were told to bring a coat to work and make sure you wore a tie. You went up to the general manager's office with all the other managers and you were formally told and everybody congratulated you. And then you wandered over to the annex to the dining room in the engineering building to the monthly staff dining room. <laughs> yeah. So it was very, very different. There was the monthly staff dining room, there was a Fort Lobby staff dining room there as well, totally separated and walled off. So things were very, very different to what they are today. And thankfully today is a lot different to what it was back then. Yeah, in the course of these years that you've described, I'm, I'm very interested to hear what you have to say about the steelworks as a site. Driving through today, or just visiting or going on tour, I'm sure it's very different in some ways and not so different in others. Can you paint a bit of a picture for us about what the site was like at the time that you were describing and how maybe it's shifted to today? Well, there have been massive changes over those, that, that, yeah, that time. I think probably, uh, yeah. people often say there were 23,000 people employed on the site. I don't think it ever was 23. It was 23 if you included the culverts. but. So you could argue there was maybe 19, 20,000 people worked here, and it was, and we did, they did everything. You could make any tour you wanted to have made. They had all their own painters, all their own carpets. Nothing was done off site. It was all done on site, and there were a lot, a lot of people. And in amongst all this, there was big cultural change as well. So I forget the year. I shouldn't forget. I think it was about '83. When we had the major downsizing, I think it was the Button Steel Plan, and the government were going to make investment easy for us, but we had to do a lot for ourselves, we had to downsize. So there was a lot of work that stopped being done, and there were a lot of people who lost their jobs. Most of them voluntarily, they took a package, and the initial package was a very, very generous one, and there were heaps of people that left. Staff and wages. And I have lost count of the number of people at that time that I spoke to saying, I don't think you should go. 
people thought it was the wrong thing for them, for their future. But in all this too, the culture changed a lot. There was a lot of industrial strife. Ever since I started here, there was, there was industrial strife. See, old story, you don't get mad to get even. And I think a lot of it was a build up of things and they decided they'd had enough. When anything came up, they were going to poke management in the eye and they did. And thankfully a heck of a lot changed since then. And uh, it's not a homogenous culture here. Yeah, there was, if you went to the Coke ovens, there was a certain Coke uh, culture that was associated with that. There's a different one in the blast furnaces, another one in the caster area, and so on. So it's trying to find a path through that where we can find some common ground to uh, get some common direction, if you like, as to where we want to go. In, in terms of place within the community in the Illawarra, I, I thought it might also be interesting to touch on this particular site where we're doing this recording, yep. Yep. Uh because while you were the first Wollongong born and raised general manager here, as far as I'm aware, you were also the last occupant or yeah, resident of this particular yep. residence. So yep. can you speak about that and why yeah, you well, were the last one? Uh, because I made it that way, I suppose. Um, this was a nice place to live in one way. Um, in another way, it wasn't. Because if anything significant happened on the plant, you heard it. So, and you'd be out of bed in a flash. But that didn't happen that often, so it wasn't. That wasn't a big issue. It was a really nice place to live. But I had a distinct impression, feeling that this was past its time. The world moved on, this is so anachronistic, it's not funny, and it's sort of a bit, you know, having yourself on. It didn't fit, it was just pretentious, I suppose. Uh, I saw myself as no different than anyone else on the planet. This sort of an advertisement that you were. I suppose to, to wrap up your assessment or remembrance of that role as general manager, is there something of which you're particularly proud of that you look back upon fondly in that role? Something that you would sum up as the key moment in your role as general manager? What I can say is that the resurrection of the safety program, and there's probably some people here that would really want to challenge this, but I know I am dead right in this. The resurrection of the safety program started in Moyala. And we had a steel meeting in Sydney and over a number of months that we had these meetings, I kept saying to the general managers, and we had a mix of them then, the businessmen types and the steel, that we are neglecting this at our peril. So we changed things around Moyala and we started to improve things and that came here and came right, right across steel. But when you think about it, it's gone much wider than just steel. The amount of talk about safety today is, well, it's really good to see. And the, and the reality is, if you give people the opportunity to contribute, they will pay back in spades. Well, I think this is a great theme or idea to bring, I think, the discussion yep. to a point. Um, I think a lot of people listening can take a lot of value or, or interesting points from what you've said. Right. Um, Hopefully. I think so. I mean, there's, there's compassion for people, there's egalitarianism, there's inventiveness, there's inclusion. And uh, I'm not just saying this to, to, to build you up, but it sounds like you were maybe a man ahead of your time. Maybe. Well, well yeah, maybe. Maybe thinking about you know, people and their value. Yeah. But um, I want to say thank you. It's a pleasure. Um, for, <coughs>